I believe in God, the Father Almighty, creator of heaven and earth. I believe in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who is conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. On the third day he rose again. He ascended into heaven. He is seated at the right hand of the Father, and he will come to judge the living and the dead. I believe in the Holy Spirit, the Holy Catholic Church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Greetings and salutations. Welcome to another episode of Coffee, the Bible, and Page. I am Paige, your caffeine-imbued host. Mm, in the beginning, coffee. Lo, it was very good. Very good. Today, we're going to continue our jaunt in Joshua. We're at Joshua chapter 11. And today, we finish up Joshua's military campaign. Um, so let's just get started. There's... Uh, it's again, I really find it fascinating when I get up in the morning and I go to read the next chapter and really not knowing what the next chapter is bringing. It's been a long time since I've read the story of Joshua. And I always start off by asking God, what are you going to show me today about you? What are you going to show me today about me? And this devotional approach to reading the Bible to me is really this method that I'm using has proven to be very successful in just opening up the scripture to me and opening up my mind to thinking bigger thoughts, more profound thoughts. You know, blessed is a man whose delight is in the law of the Lord and in it, in it he meditates day and night. You know, I spend most of my day thinking about a lot of the stuff that I read and that we talk about, that I talk about in this podcast. And, um, that's what meditate means in that context, to talk to yourself, to mutter to yourself. So blessed is a man who delights in the law of the Lord, and he mutters about it to himself throughout the day. That's kind of what I'm doing here. Thinking with my mouth open. This isn't a deep dive, um, though I'll tell you what, I've, I've gotten some subjects I've taken notes of that I would love to do a deeper dive into and do a more detailed Bible study, and I might do that down the road. But right now, what I do is I read a chapter, and when I'm doing this podcast, I'm right at the beginning of my thinking process. Uh, I haven't put a lot of thought into it ahead of time because I'm up for the adventure of finding out what God has to speak to me in a fresh word today. And... Um, and the danger in doing that is that I might think some irrational thoughts or wrong thoughts, or I just might be just totally out to lunch. But I'm, I take that chance. And I have some really good friends who listen to this and, that I trust and admire. And if I get off base, they're quick to uh, tap me on the shoulder and uh, get me back on track. So having said that, allow me to read Joshua chapter 11 and to think with my mouth open. And the thought that trail that God took me on today was to answer the question, or at least to address the issue of the destruction of all these cities in, uh, in the area. I have some friends who would call this genocide, that God and Joshua were, were committing genocide against all these cultures and civilizations. Um, and so we're going to address that. Is it Was it genocide? Is it just a random act of violence by a capricious God uh, who just wanted to push people out and put his chosen people in the middle of Israel, of what would become Israel? Um, so that's kind of the thought that's in my head as I'm reading through this. So let's get started. Chapter 11, when Jabin, king of Hazor, heard of this, in other words, the conquering of uh, the previous, the southern half of the kingdom, he sent word to Jobab, king of Madon, to the kings of Shimron and Akshaph, and to the northern kings who were in the mountains in the Arabah, south of Kinnereth, 
in the western foothills, and in Naphoth Dor on the west, and to the Canaanites in the east and west, to the Amorites, Hittites, Perizzites, Jebusites in the hill country, and to the Hivites below Hermon in the region of Mizpah. They came out with all their troops and a large number of horses and chariots, a huge army, as numerous as a sand on the seashore. All these kings joined forces and made camp together out of the waters of Merom to fight against Israel. The Lord said to Joshua, Do not be afraid of them, because by this time tomorrow I will hand all of them slain over to Israel. You are to hamstring their horses and burn their chariots. So Joshua and his whole army came against them suddenly at the waters of Merom and attacked them. And the Lord gave them into the hand of Israel. They defeated them and pursued them all the way to greater Sidon, the Misrephoth Maim, and to the valley of Mizpah on the east, until no survivors were left. Joshua did to them as the Lord had directed. He hamstrung their horses and burned their chariots. At that time, Joshua turned back and captured Hazor and put its king to the sword. Now, Hazor had been the head of all these kingdoms. Everyone in it they put to the sword. They totally destroyed them, not sparing anyone that breathed, and he burned Hazor itself. Joshua took all these royal cities and their kings and put them to the sword. He totally destroyed them as Moses, the servant of the Lord, had commanded. Yet, Israel did not burn any of the cities built on their mounds except Hazor, which Joshua burned. The Israelites carried off for themselves all the plunder and livestock of these cities, but all the people they put to the sword until they completely destroyed them, not sparing anyone that breathed. As the Lord commanded his servant Moses, so Moses commanded Joshua, and Joshua did it. He left nothing undone of all that the Lord commanded Moses. So Joshua took this entire land, the hill country, all the Negev, the whole region of Goshen, the western foothills, the Arabah, and the mountains of Israel with their foothills from Mount Halak, which rises towards Seir, to Baal Gad in the valley of Lebanon below Mount Hermon. He captured all their kings and put them to death. Joshua waged war against all these kings for a long time. Now, I've highlighted this next section because this is going to be the focus of my thoughts. Except, you see, he waged war against all these kings for a long time, except for the Hivites living in Gibeon. Not one city made a treaty of peace with the Israelites. Only the Gibeonites did, who took them all in battle. Mm. For it was the Lord himself who hardened their hearts. In parentheses is my, I added this in, as he did with Pharaoh, to wage war against Israel so that he might destroy them totally, exterminating them without mercy as the Lord had commanded Moses. At that time, Joshua went and destroyed the Anakites, from the hill country, from Hebron, Deber, and Anab, and from all the hill country of Judah, and from all the hill country of Israel. Joshua totally destroyed them and their towns. No Anakites were left in Israelite territory. Only in Gaza, Gath, and Ashdod did any survive. So Joshua took the entire land, just as the Lord had directed Moses, and he gave it as an inheritance to Israel, according to their tribal divisions, and then the land had rest from war. Thus endeth Joshua's conquest. Now, I got an animated map here I found. Uh, let's take a look at this. So you can see the progress uh, of Joshua. It starts off with Moses to the east of uh, uh, the Jordan River. And then we're going to find, we're going to see a map of how Joshua did his conquest. Hang on. All right, let's see here. There we are. So there's Moses and Israel traveling around in the wilderness. Now we're going to start Joshua's uh, Jericho campaign. Now Joshua's southern campaign. followed by this chapter's Northern Campaign. And there we are, done. All right. Now, to me, the elephant in the room brought by this uh, campaign of Joshua into, into what would become Israel 
is, it seems like a pretty merciless act by a supposedly merciful God. I mean, there's a lot of destruction going on here. Um, all these people that are killed and, and uh, all these cities destroyed. Um, it just, you know, some might call it genocide. Well, on the surface, yeah, it might appear that, you know, God is pretty cruel and unjust. Well, he's not unjust. A couple things that popped out at me. First of all, if if genocide were if genocide were the uh, uh, goal here, then nobody of these people that were living in this region would have survived. He would have killed all of them. He would have destroyed every trace of that civilization if if that were what God was after. Yet we see time and again where when someone outside of Israel bows their knee to Yahweh, he accepts them. Rahab, the harlot, um, innkeeper, a Gentile, she was not of Jewish extraction. And yet she recognized the God of Israel. And she recognized that Israel was going to be coming. And she basically submitted and she granted favor to Israel's spies, which in essence is granting favor to Israel's God. And she was spared. In fact, she was accepted into the Jewish community to the point where she actually became an ancestress of Jesus. Jesus had a Gentile prostitute in his ancestry. It's pretty amazing. God made room for Rahab. And the Gibeonites, to their credit, they saw what was coming. They knew they could not defeat Israel. They knew they could not defeat the God of Israel. So yes, they resorted to subterfuge in order to trick Israel into granting them a treaty. But in the process of doing that, they were admitting who Yahweh was. They were realizing that Joshua and his God were going to win. And in essence, they submitted themselves to that. And they tied themselves to Joshua's future and to God's, the future that God had planned. And God spared them. So you see, if if genocide were the deal, were the deal, God would still have just wiped Gibeonites off the face of the map. He would have killed Rahab. If he didn't want, God always has room at his table for anybody who will bow their knee to him. For anybody who will ask for mercy, he grants mercy. Um, so then what, what was the deal about what Israel being God's chosen people? Well, he, why did he, did God choose Israel to be uh, exclusively his people? Uh, if you weren't of Israel, you couldn't be God's, you couldn't be part of God's family. We know that's not true. Again, I just quoted to you, showed you Rahab, and we, we see the Gibeonites. And we see time and again, people outside of Israel, God still spoke to them. Melchizedek is a good example. Um, the, he was the king of Jerusalem when Abraham was living in the area. And he came out and blessed Abraham. And he was a godly man by all accounts. He knew who Yahweh was. Now, his descendants, who lived in Jerusalem by the time of Joshua, uh, they took that king at that time, put, took on the name Adonai Zedek, which is the Lord is righteous. He took upon himself identifying with Adonai, which is Lord. and uh, But yet he was not one of God's men. Um. But there were people like uh, Moses' father-in-law recognized who Yahweh was. Um, there were people who were of Egypt, who left Egypt with Israel, outsiders. So God always has room and a place for people to enter into communion with him and to be grafted into his family. 
Um, they made a big deal in the New Testament when Gentiles started being saved. They couldn't understand that because the the concept of being a chosen people in many in Israel's eyes was a very nationalistic view. They were God's chosen people. Only Jews could be part of God's chosen people. Well, yes, the Jews were God's chosen nation, but they weren't chosen in the sense that they were going to be the only uh, members of his family. Jesus said, he told the disciples, says, I've got, I've got, I got sheep and other flocks I got to go see. I've got to deal with. And he's talking about us. We Gentiles, when we bow our knee to the God of the universe, the Alpha, the Omega, the beginning and the end, when we do that, we're accepted into his family. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever, not just Jewish, whosoever believes won't perish. So we know that God's heart is open and available to anybody who wants to bow their knee and submit to him. Now, second part here. Uh, Let's go back to this here. There we are. For it was the Lord himself who hardened their hearts. Joshua waged war against all these kings for a long time, except for the Hivites, Hivites living in Gibeon. Not one city made a treaty of peace with the Israelites, who took them all in battle, with the exception of the Gibeonites. Israel took all these other cities in battle. Why? Because it was the Lord himself who hardened their hearts. Now, do you remember the story of Pharaoh and Moses? How through about the first half of all the the signs and wonders when Moses was having these contests with the magicians of Pharaoh's court. Uh, It reached a point where a very curious statement is made. We hear, we says, and God hardened Pharaoh's heart. Now that sounds, again, pretty cruel. Do you mean Pharaoh couldn't be saved? Not from that point on. God hardened Pharaoh's heart. In fact, the word there kind of has a, brings the concept of strengthening. God strengthened Pharaoh's heart. He gave Pharaoh strength to stand up against him because there were going to be some really huge miracles coming down the road. And God strengthened Pharaoh's heart so that Pharaoh could withstand him. Now, again, that sounds mean, doesn't it? But when you look at it, this, the way I'm about to share with you, you can see the justice in it. Up until the time that God hardened Pharaoh's heart, Pharaoh was hardening his heart. It was an active choice on the part of Pharaoh to fight against the God of Israel. In essence, he was telling the God of Israel, I don't want you. I don't want you. I don't want you. And God eventually says, all right, I'm going to give you the desire of your heart. You don't want me. You can't have me. And he hardened Pharaoh's heart. Now, these people that were living in Israel, what would become Israel, in the promised land, they were descended from people who knew who Yahweh was. Noah's sons, one of Noah's sons, Shem, Ham, or Japheth, I can't remember which, I have to go back and check. But they settled in this area. They knew who God was. They knew who the God of their father, Noah, was. And there was knowledge of Yahweh. Um, throughout Moses's journey, we see him coming across people that knew who God was, that knew who the God of Israel, Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was. But by the time Joshua crossed Jericho, the descendants of these people who knew who the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was, had had generations of hardening their own hearts, of willingly turning away from the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. But even in the midst of these people, there were pockets of people, the Gibeonites, they knew who the God was, the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob was. And Rahab, she submitted to the God of Abraham, Isaac, and Jacob. Even though they had very limited understanding of who that was, they still, within their power, they moved towards God. Hmm. And God spared them. So why were these people wiped out by Joshua and his army? Because God hardened their hearts. But he only hardened their hearts 
because that was their will. They said, we don't want you. We will not follow you. We have other gods that we're interested in. And God said, okay. Eventually, God reaches a point where he says, I'm going to give you the desires of your heart. You don't want me. I'll make it so you can't have me. And when people die in that state, they spent their entire life saying, we don't want God. And God will answer that desire. And he'll say, all right, you go live in a place where I'm not. That's called hell. Hell is a place where God's presence is not. See, right now in this world that we live in, even if you're not a believer, there are believers in your midst that God is, whom God is blessing and whom God is moving through. And you still get to experience many of God's blessings through the heart, lives, and actions of his followers. But if you continue to refuse him, eventually, eventually God will give you your heart's desire. If your heart's desire is not to have God in your life, he'll make it so that you won't. And see, that's what makes, that's what makes uh, this such an important issue, what to do with God. Because there will be a point where there is no return. There is no turning back. You'll stand in front of him and he'll say, I'm going to give you your heart's desire. You don't want me? I'll make it so you can't have me. Depart from me, you wicked, into the fire prepared for the devil and his angels. But Lord, they will say that day, we did all these wonderful things for you. He says, yeah, but I never knew you. Depart from me, you evildoers. These people that were living in these cities, in the promised land, they'd had generations to turn to God. Oh, what page, you might say. They, they didn't know. They didn't have anybody to teach them about God. But you know what? Paul, Paul lays this out pretty clearly in Romans. He says, you know, the world around us gives us all that we need to know about the God of the universe, his omnipotence, his power. Uh, I grew up in Alaska. And there were many times as a child, I'd be camping or I'd be outside and I'd look up at the stars and I'd be surrounded by all this incredible beauty of Alaska. And I knew there was a God and I didn't know, I didn't know him. I didn't know him by name. Uh, there wasn't any relationship to speak of, but I knew there was a God because this couldn't be accidental. So they're without excuse. Even if Rahab, who didn't understand hardly anything about the God of Israel, she understood enough to recognize who he was to an extent where she actually submitted to him and was accepted into the family of God. Hmm. I could go on and on about that. But that's the big thing that I'm taking out of this uh, chapter today is that this was not genocide by a capricious God who just decided to wipe people off the face of the planet. These people were enemies of God. And they proved it by being enemies of God's people. Does that make sense? They, The Lord hardened their hearts because that's what they wanted. They wanted to defy God. God said, okay. I'm going to strengthen you. I'm going to strengthen you so that you can. And that's God's justice. He's merciful, but there will come a time when you will hear the trumpet sound of God, God's angels, and Jesus will return and it'll be everybody out of the pool. Time will be no more. And then justice will be dealt. But until that time, it's, there's time for mercy. There was always time for mercy. In fact, not everybody who lived in the promised land was destroyed. We, we see at, uh, let me get down here. We see at the end, uh, let's see, at that time, I says here, all right, at that time, Joshua went and destroyed the Anakites 
from Hebron, Deborah and Ahab, Anab, from all the hill country of Judah, and from all the hill country of Israel. Joshua totally destroyed them and their towns. No Anakites were left in Israelite territory. Only in Gaza, Gath, and Ashdod did any survive. There were still survivors. So this wasn't genocide. This was war against people who decided to make war against God's people. And in so doing, making war against God. There's a lot of parallels here to me that come to mind um, in today's world. As the world makes war against God's people, they're making war against God. And there eventually will be a time when God will put his foot down. Time will be no more. And then justice will be dealt. Okay, well, that's enough for now. Thank you for uh, being such a downer, uh, Debbie Downer page. At some point, God's justice will show up. But until then, it's all about his mercy. Hmm. All right. Well, this is Paige. Here's my coffee. Hmm. I'm out of here. Have a great day. Bye-bye. God's thoughts are not our thoughts. Neither should my thoughts be your thoughts. You need to think for yourself.